Welcome to the Providence Book Festival. I hope you're all having a great time today. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Lisa Barrett, PhD. Lisa has published over 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers appearing in Science, Nature Neuroscience, and other top journals in Psychology and Cognitive Neuroscience, as well as six volumes published by the Guilford Press. She has also given popular TED Talks, Barrett received a National Institutes of Health Directors Pioneer Award for her revolutionary research on the emotion in the brain. The paradigm shift has a far-reaching implication not only for psychology, but also medicine, the legal system, airport security, child rearing, and even meditation. Leading the charge is psychologist and neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett, whose theory of emotion is driving a deeper understanding of the mind and brain and what it means to be human. How emotions are made reveals the latest research and intriguing practical applications of the new science of emotion, mind, and brain. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is, uh, we're such a cozy group, I feel like we should sort of get all the chairs and put them in a circle and tell each other our names and like we do in a <laughs> seminar. Um, what I'm going to do uh, today is I'm going to read from a couple of excerpts from the book and then leave a lot of time for questions because uh, in my experience people have a lot of questions. So when my daughter was 12 years old, her name is Sophia, uh, her dad and I, her dad's right here, uh, threw her a birthday party with the theme of gross foods. I made pizza that I doctored to look uh, green and fuzzy, like it had mold. I made vomit jello, which I'm happy to share the recipe with you for this. That, you guys are a tough crowd. Like, vomit jello made of peach jello with little bits of chopped up vegetable in it. I served apple juice, white apple juice in urine cups. Um, but the best part of this uh, party was the game that we did after lunch. What I did was I took baby food, mashed carrots, mashed beef, and so on, and I smeared it artfully on um, disposable diapers to look like poo. And then I had the kids take a diaper, take, hold it up to their nose, take a good deep whiff of it, um, and then they had to identify the food uh, by the smell. Even though the kids knew that this was baby food, many of them gagged, forcefully gagged um, uh, at the smell. I actually gagged a couple of times while I was actually placing the food on the diapers, even though uh, you know, I knew it was uh, food as well. And this, believe it or not, actually, this experience holds the key to understanding how emotions are made. Uh, the science of emotion is filled with a lot of fascinating detail. Much of it is very counterintuitive. Each day we feel the delight of happiness, the burn of anger. I don't know about you, sometimes I'm feeling the um, delight of anger when I read the newspaper. Um, the fear, um, the dread of fear. And we're surrounded by people who are caught up in the throes of their own emotions. But these experiences, as compelling as they are, don't actually reveal what is going on inside your brain and your body to create emotions, the emotions that you experience every day. And that's because the human brain is actually a master of deception. You thought you were an honest person, but actually you own a very deceptive brain. It creates experiences and directs actions with a magician's skill never revealing exactly how it works. And the whole time, the brain is giving you a false sense of confidence that its products, which are your day-to-day -day experiences, reveal its inner workings. Emotions seem distinct and feel built in. Right? They seem to trigger without warning, kind of taking over our thoughts and actions, sometimes causing us to do very unfortunate things, and so we assume that sadness and fear and joy and other emotions each have separate causes inside of us, you know, like there are these circuits, um, supposedly animalistic circuits, kind of lurking deep inside some ancient part of your brain for emotions. 
But you know, when you have a brain like ours, it's very easy to come up with the wrong theory of emotion because we are really just a bunch of brains trying to figure out how brains work. And so it's important to start with first principles. If you look around the room, look around the room, what do you see? Each other, some chairs, you see me. To us it seems as if this visual information just hits our uh, retina, makes its way to the brain, and so uh, the visual information, it feels to us as if it's just like triggering neurons so we see stuff around us, like we're just seeing what's out there. But that's actually not what's happening. And to demonstrate this to you, I'm going to have my husband, who is functioning as my lovely assistant this morning, show you um, an image. I'm doing this very low tech because I didn't actually realize that we'd have slides available today. So this is without a computer. Um, so who here sees a white square in the middle of this um, cardboard? Yeah. But there's actually no white square there. This is a visual illusion called a Kinesa square. Um, and it, so the question is, how is it that your brain is conjuring a square in the middle of this um, uh, cardboard where there actually is no square? And really, what does this have to do with the nature of emotion anyways? Well, the answer is um, that your brain is actually adding stuff from your vast array of prior experiences with other squares, with boxes, with rooms, with angles, anything where there's a, a, a sort of an edge. And it's constructing a square where uh, there is no square. It's causing you to see lines where there are no lines, so you see an image where there actually is no image. So basically, you're hallucinating. Not the scary, I better get myself to the hospital kind of hallucination, um, but the everyday sort of, uh, my brain is built to work like this hallucination. I'm gonna, let's do the other one too, just for fun. Um, so here's another, uh, how many of you have um, seen my TED talk? Okay, good, oh good. Okay, so, yep. What do you see? Anybody? A face. A face? Okay. Squiggly lines. So what's happening in your brain right now is that it's trying to figure out what this is. It's trying to draw on past experience to try to see something in these blobs. And because that's how brains work. And if you can't, if your brain can't draw on past experience in order to make sense of the sensory inputs, you experience something called experiential blindness, which means you're looking at something, but you can't figure out what it is. Experiential blindness also happens when, for example, you hear um, someone speaking a language that you are not fluent in. And so it, to you, it just sounds like noise, right? Or for me, when I'm listening to my daughters playing dubstep, or right, it just sounds like noise to me. Um, and, uh, but let me uh, cure you of your experiential blindness. Do you want me to hold that? So, All right. Lovely assistant, yeah, okay. Ready to be cured? Are you ready to be cured? Yes. Okay. Okay, let's do it one more time for everybody just so they get the... It worked. He's doing really well um, just simulating being a computer for me here. <laughs> All right, so how many of you now see a snake? Okay, so what's happening is this really miraculous thing that um, you are... Well, if you take away the yellow snake now. Yeah, thank you. Um, what's happening now is that your brain is now searching uh, your past experience, uh, and it found something that it can now use, even though it's past experience only from a few moments ago. It now has something that it can use to create the image of a snake where there is no snake. 
because your brain is actually in making lines where there are no lines so that you can see an image that actually isn't really there. And I can tell you that if you decide to go and watch my TED Talk, you will see this illusion, um, which is where I used it the first time in public. And um, uh, I think it's the first time I used it in public. And um, once you, if you go and you look at it, uh, you look at the, the blobby image again, um, what you will see is a snake, almost instantaneously, or at least the head of a snake. So these experiences reveal to us a couple of insights. The first is that your past experience from direct encounters, from photographs, from movies and books and so on, give meaning to your sensations, to the visual sensations, auditory sensations, and so on that you, um, that you encounter. <clears throat> and the entire process, <clears throat> excuse me, the entire process of how your brain uses the past to construct the present is completely invisible to you. No matter how hard you try, you can't observe yourself ex constructing the image. Um, and in fact, that's why we needed these specially designed examples to reveal to you actually what your brain is doing. The little magic trick that we just performed here is, has a scientific name. It's called simulation. It means that your brain is changing the firing of its own sensory neurons in the absence of incoming sensory inputs. So you see things that aren't there, and you hear things that aren't there. For example, how many of you have ever had a song going through your head that you can't get out of your head no matter what you do? Yeah. That's an audit, that auditory hallucination is uh, a simulation. It's exactly the same kind of thing. And it's really remarkable because if you think about it, your brain is changing the firing of its own neurons without input. And this happens on a regular basis um, uh, throughout life. So for example, I want you now to think about the last time that someone handed you a red juicy apple. You reached out for it, you took a bite, you experienced a tart, maybe sort of slightly sweet flavor. And during these moments, your neurons were firing in, uh, in the sensory and motor regions of your brain. Motor regions fired to produce the movements to grab the apple and bite it. Sensory neurons fired um, so that you could see the red, um, uh, the redness of the apple. Maybe it has a little bit of a blush green. Um, the smoothness against your hand, its crisp floral scent, the audible crunch when you bite into it, the tangy taste, and so on. Maybe other neurons uh, made your mouth water to release enzymes so you could begin digesting the apple, released cortisol to prepare the apple to metabolize the sugars in the apple. I should just, this is an aside, cortisol is not a stress hormone. We can talk about that afterwards if you'd like. It's actually a hormone that gets glucose into your bloodstream quickly. Always, not just when you're stressed. Um, but for example, when you eat something, you uh, need cortisol to help metabolize the sugar, uh, the glucose into, into something that you can use, that your brain can use, and that your body can use. Mm -hmm. And even there are neurons that will probably, you know, caused your stomach to start churning. So the really cool thing is that just now when I say the word apple, if I had you in a brain scanner and I was looking at your brain, we would see changes that in sensory and motor neurons that are very similar to what happens when you actually are eating an apple. We would see changes in motor neurons that in the mouth region and in the hand region. We would see changes in the neurons that code for taste and for vision and so on. And what your brain is doing right now, how many of you, for example, can see kind of the ghost of an apple in your mind's eye? And how many of you can kind of, you know, hear the crunch of the apple when you take a bite or taste the sort of the tangy sort of sweetness to have an apple? So again, your brain, the reason why you have these ghost, like ghostly like experiences is that your brain is changing the firing of your own sensory neurons. Um, 
to use, basically it's using past experiences of apples that you've encountered to construct the mental instance of an apple. And your brain is simulating this non-existent apple uh, basically uh, automatically and quickly, as automatically as your heart beats. Because this is business as usual for your brain. This is actually how your brain works. And so in How Emotions Are Made, the book that I'm here to talk to you about today, I explain how the square and the blobby uh, snake image and the apple are actually no different from what you are doing right now, for example. You may think that you're listening to me speak, reacting to my words, being terribly impressed with this reading, <laughs> I'm sure. But in fact, your brain is creating simulations um, that predict, that anticipate every word that comes out of my mouth. And if I had said my ear or my nose, or some other orifice of my body, not a laugh, okay. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> um, and that's really remarkable, right? That um, right now, uh, the whole reason why you can understand the words that I'm speaking is because your brain is actually guessing and simulating and anticipating what I'm gonna say next. Simulation is actually the most important neuroscientific discovery, or I would say one of the most important in the last decade, because it leads to an unintuitive and very revolutionary insight, um, which is that your brain does not react to things in the world. It predicts. It is predicting all the time. What you see, what you hear, what you taste, and so on, are predictions that your brain generates as simulations, which are then tested against uh, the sensory inputs from the world. So for example, if I had pulled out an apple and showed it to you, and you had grabbed it and taken a bite, what your brain would be doing in that instant is comparing the sensory inputs that come from that apple to its simulation. And the two together really make your experience. So your brain isn't just sitting around waiting to be stimulated, it's constantly guessing at what's going to happen next. And those guesses, those simulations, guide your actions and become your experience. Now, um, what's, what's really cool about this is that how, your simulations aren't just guesses for what's gonna happen next. They're also explanations about what are about what is about to cause the sensations that you're about to encounter. And um, so there are many things that could be round and red um, that you could grab, right? But how do you know it's an apple? It's because as your brain is anticipating and making these guesses, it's actually, these guesses are actually sort of the anticipatory um, there, it's sort of trying, your brain is trying to guess at what the cause is of the sensations that are about to emerge. And the really uh, interesting thing is that, that what we've talked about here in terms of objects and events in the world actually also holds for what's going on inside your own body. From your brain's perspective, it has to, it's receiving sensory inputs from the world and from the body. These sensory inputs are the effects of some set of causes, and your brain has to guess at what the causes are. So when you, for example, have an ache in your gut, it could be many, caused by many things. So just in the same way that a red, you know, a red round object can be many things, an ache in your gut um, can be many things, and your brain has to guess at what those are. And that, knowing that, is actually the secret to understanding how emotions are made. From your brain's perspective, your body is just another source of sensory input that it has to make meaningful. Sensations from your heart um, pounding, from your lungs expanding and contracting, from changes in temperature, in metabolism, in glucose, and so on, they're ambiguous because they can have many different causes. These purely physical sensations in your body actually have no objective psychological meaning. 
A change in heart rate is not objectively or necessarily an emotion. It might be, but it might also be caused by other, um, uh, other there might be also other causes, like you, know, you might have had uh, too much coffee, or uh, you might have just uh, walked up the stairs. Yep. Um, if you feel an ache in your stomach when you're sitting at a dinner table, you might experience it as hunger. If it's flu season, uh, just around the corner, that exact same ache in your gut might be experienced as nausea. If you're a judge in a courtroom, you might experience that ache in your gut as evidence that the defendant is uh, not trustworthy. In a given moment, in a given context, your brain is using your past experience to guess at the causes of the internal sensations in your body using external sensations from the world um, to uh, create an explanation. And that's what an emotion is. From an aching stomach, your brain can construct an instance of hunger or nausea or mistrust. If you think about uh, sniffing a diaper that is heavy with pureed lamb, like my daughter's friends did at the birthday party, an ache in your gut might be um, experienced as disgust. If your lover just walked into a room, you might experience the ache in your gut as a pang of longing. If you're in a doctor's office waiting for tests, you might experience that ache in your gut as anxiety. And in each case, disgust, longing, and anxiety, your brain is using past experiences to guess at the causes of that ache in your gut, um, constructing uh, an emotion. And this is how your brain constructs your experiences and also guides your actions, because if your brain believes that the ache is disgust, or is longing, or is anxiety, you will do, it, will it will prepare you to do different things in each of those cases. And so this is how emotions are made. Emotions are meaning. They are explanations um, for body sensations in terms of what is going on around you in the world. The simulations that make your emotions not only give you your feelings, they also guide your actions. They lead you to act in a particular way. So, Emotions are not your reactions to the world. They're your constructions of the world. They are what your body sensations mean to you in a given situation in a way that guides your action. Now this perspective, I realize, is very new to you, probably. It's new to most people. The book, uh, How Emotions Are Made, provides many uh, examples and evidence um, to help you understand how uh, the brain works in this way. Um, and uh, as we heard in the introduction, this knowledge empowers you um, in many domains of your life to be an architect of your own emotional life, of your own experience. And uh, we're running out of time today, but um, uh, if you go to my website, lisafeldmanbarrett.com, you can find uh, a lot of um, videos, explanations, um, other public lectures I've given, op-eds and, and articles I've written in um, popular uh, newspapers and magazines and so on that explain um, the bits and pieces of this, uh, this scientific perspective. So thank you for your attention. I think we, do we have time for questions? Perfect, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the most surprising things that, uh, to me, that you just said was that this, that we would think of this as new and unusual, and yet perhaps for this very specific audience, I think that this is really familiar and almost an old adage. Uh, I teach creative writing, and one of our teaching creative writing adages, and I've probably written over a million times, <laughs> is the show don't tell. I mean, uh, the, the show don't tell adage, um, because uh, you are trying to draw people in with sensory stimulus and, uh, and make that connection for them. Um, and so in some ways, I feel like this is a scientific explanation of why that works. Absolutely. So I think you're absolutely right. I think writers, and I've known this for very long, you know, probably forever. Um, and in some ways, there actually are some old scientific 
ideas too that point to the idea that the brain is not reactive, that it's predictive, that it's simulating, that you can just say a couple of words to you know, someone and, um, and they can um, create a whole image uh, inside their own heads and that that's really how wonder, that's how fiction works you know, at its best and maybe even uh, hopefully nonfiction. <laughs> um, I think what's really surprising to people, the predictive aspect I think is surprising to people. I don't think people think too much about the implications of what this means for their everyday life. So the fact that fiction works this way, what does that actually mean about your experiences? I'll tell you what it means. What it means is that you are the author in part of your own experiences. Even when it feels to you as if something is happening to you, you are still somewhat an author of your experience. And I think the power of words to a writer is not that surprising, but to the average person, when I say something like, I can, take, I can text three words to someone halfway around the world. They don't need to see my face, they don't need to hear my voice, and I can affect their bodies because their brain is simulating what those words mean. That's a, people do find that surprising, I think. Well, I think one of the great applications of, of having it articulated that way for me is that it gives the uh, reason why one looks for uh, a fresh image in poetry or in fiction, because it's almost as if you want to increase the, the need for that simulation, but not so much. So, you know, if you say, well, that's a reach, or that just isn't quite right, that the, the simulation is not right. But if it's just a cliche, you're too quickly able to fill in that uh, that image for yourself, yeah. and so the poem or the story doesn't read uh, doesn't read as interesting. I, I will I will tell you that I've had a number. I've you know I've had a this book has been was published two, two years ago now, and it's still do, doing you know st selling pretty steadily. I'm still my emails I'm receiving are still pretty steady, um, uh, and I've I've had you know a, a huge response I would say from authors and filmmakers in particular interested in the structure of narrative and, um, uh, and you know, storytelling, um, who, who, who their reaction is pr very similar to yours, which is that this is a, this is a, a neural explanation of why it, wor why it works to show, don't tell. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Other questions? Yep. I have a uh, six-month-old grandson. His neural networks are pretty empty. His memory is pretty unused, yet he's starting to figure things out. But in essence, he has nothing of the patterns that you're talking about yeah. in there. Chapter five. <laughs> Chapter five. Chapter five. Chapter five. Yeah, it's totally in there. So here's what I would say, very briefly. This is actually really fascinating. Um, we actually study infants, uh, network development in infants, actually. Um, and we have a, I have a scientific uh, review paper on this topic as well. But for babies, um, they, uh, for them, you know how I said to you when I, if, if I actually showed you the apple, your brain would compare it and then it would take in the difference. Well, for that, we call that prediction error. And for babies, it's all prediction error all the time. Um, and we're actually what's happening is the words that you speak, the, um, the, the cuddles that you give your grandson, the, um, the, you're um, regulating his nervous system by feeding him and, uh, and um, keeping him warm and so on. Um, all of those things are actually wiring his brain. They are establishing, it's not really true that the networks aren't there. They're there in a rudimentary form and they are unfinished. Um, and so everything that you do Every interaction that you have with that infant actually is building the, um, it's seeding his brain to have a model that it, he can, that his brain will use to make the predictions to experience the world. So here's what we know. We know that for the first couple of years of life is, are hugely important, much more important than we ever thought um, because those plant the seeds those years for um, what the brain will use um, to make the predictions that become his experience and guide his actions. And so um, uh, it's, a really, it's, it's a really, really important time of life. Uh, and uh, 
and I think you should have fun with it. It's a, it's a wonderful, yeah. I remember my, you know, babies are amazing because they can't, compared to other animals, they're so, like, incompetent. They can't do anything. They can't even, I remember the, my, I remember my daughter's the first time that she tried to intentionally move her arm. She couldn't quite do it, right? Like she was trying to hit something, like a, you know, a mobile that was dangling. And she, she missed by a million miles, but she was looking right at it, and there was like an effort there, and she was trying really hard. The thing is that um, our reaction to how, our response to how, to what she did in that instance w is something that her brain took in and learned. You know, there's a, in psychology, we have a fancy name for prediction error. What we call it, what, what people do with it, we call it learning. That's what learning is. Learning is when there's, you know, what's in your, in your brain is not sufficient. There's something that you didn't expect that's there or something that you expected that's not there and your brain takes that information in and adjusts. The really cool thing is that if I had actually, when you guys were imagining an apple, if I had actually pulled out an apple and showed it to you, and it was exactly the way you were simulating it, no new information would, from this apple would make it into your brain. Because your brain, your neurons are already firing in a way that lets you capture the sensory features of the apple. So it's a very, very, very efficient way to run a brain actually, to run a nervous system. And all brains work this way. Every brain on this planet works this way. The thing is that um, it's very efficient if you have a good model of the world, if your brain is seeded with enough experiences to have a good model of the world. Um, but if it isn't, then things don't work so efficiently. And um, this is why childhood adversity, children, when they grow in adversity, they grow to um, their brain grows in a way that is not, it's not as efficient as it would have been otherwise. And the inefficiency accumulates over time and that's why childhood you know, adversity predicts metabolic illnesses in adolescence and in adulthood. Increases in diabetes, increases in heart disease, increases in depression. Is it, there's a very direct relationship to what little babies experience um, and uh, which will set the development, trajectory of development of a brain in a particular way that will, you know, seed health or, or seed illness. I think we're probably done. But I'm, I think I'm gonna be uh, signing books and I'm also happy to answer questions when I, when I, I saw your, your hands, but signing books in the ball, on the ballroom level, yes. Thank you.